So what you can see is they're starting to pull this net up and they've got a researcher in the front of the boat. He's testing for toxins, mercury, things like that. It's a gentleman in the center there in the blue with his back to us working hard. That's the guy that manages this particular lake. And his job is to make sure there's enough fish in here. And as you see, as they pull this net, there's lots of fish in that net. And uh, looks like they got some smaller walleyes, Mr. Kyle. Those look like your smaller ones. There you go. And all those that are alive will be released, guys, and any of them that are not alive will be either donated to people that have licenses that want the food, or the gentleman in the front of the boat taking notes will use them for sampling for mercury. But unless they know what's in the lake, they can't effectively manage it, and the only way to know what's in it is to sample. That's a great big walleye right there. So they're gonna be quick about getting that one released. 2680. That's a nice one. Hold that real quick and then dunk her back. That's a beautiful walleye. And you can launch her off the back and she'll be good to go. Let her go. You're out here doing standardized sampling, okay? What does that mean for our viewers at home? What does standardized sampling mean and what do you accomplish with it? So standardized sampling, we're looking to keep as many variables at in uh, order as possible. So we set the same 20 gill nets and horse tooth over three days towards the end of May. So your water level conditions are relatively the same. Stratification in the lake is relatively the same. We're trying to hold as many environmental variables constant. So then the data, the trend data, as far as a catch per unit effort is gonna be most reliable. So it's more than the snapshot. It's not a population estimate in the lake. It's giving us trend data, number of walleye per net. We can look at length and weight data on the fish as well. Gotcha, okay. Now that doesn't happen unless you're gill netting. Now one thing I know for sure, uh, what, what you and I catch as anglers and what these guys catch with that big net right there is a totally different thing. So if you think you know the lake, I promise you don't know it as well as you might think. Having said that, your gill nets have different size holes yep. for catching different size fish. Yeah, you can see right here, so this is the small mesh. They're, these are experimental gill nets, so one end is going to be small and they graduate up. They're in 25 foot panels. And then at the other end of the net, we have large mesh, mesh. And that's just to allow us to sample different species and then also different sizes of species. At the same time. So at the same time. And you lightly touched on shocking electrofishing. Mm -hmm. Electrofishing puts what, like 900 volts or something in the water? Yeah, it's usually yeah, between four and 500 probably when we do it here. Okay, and that temporarily stuns the fish. That's important, important to point out because they float up and they all look like they're done at that point, but they're not. They're very quickly stunned and almost as quickly recover. As soon as you take them out of the water, the water has the electrical current and we'll put them in a tub in the boat and they're swimming around. We have very little mortality. What about seines? Do you do any seining here? The difference between seining and gill netting, the seine, the seine itself has moved into shallow water and shows you lots of little stuff. Yep, so we'll, we'll seine. We don't do it every year, but we do it in most years. We've got 10 standardized locations again around, around the reservoir to look at that you know, the young of year type population of fish or just even the minnows in the in the lake. It gives us a different look. All of these different types of gear are tailored toward catching different fish to help paint that entire picture of the reservoir. Of the entire reservoir, right. And then Mark's testing for mercury here while he's been on the lake on this particular trip. Is there any other toxins you're routinely testing for? Or is it mostly mercury? Mainly mercury and horse tooth. Yep. And, and what about other fisheries here in Northern Colorado? It's primarily mercury as well. You're the managing biologist. Um, you'll pull all this data together. Your researchers will put it all together. They'll look at a trend, or you'll look at a trend. Uh, are we getting more walleyes, less walleyes? Are they getting older? Are they getting younger? Are they healthier, less healthy, by body, body conditioning wise? And then you'll make decisions every five years, correct? Right. And you compile all this data, you've got all this information. Uh, Joe Average Angler doesn't maybe always get to visit with you guys. If they wanted to find the data on the information on how you're managing various lakes, where would they do it? Uh, so you can visit our website at Colorado Parks and Wildlife and you can get a lot of the data there for these high, higher, higher profile reservoirs like horse tooth. We try to summarize all this data. It's all made available to the public as we can. Kyle, thank you for everything you do. I appreciate it very much, not just here, but all the other lakes. And, and we tell all your cohorts that as well. You guys as well. I know it's, uh, I've been in your shoes a whole bunch of times. And I know it's uh, sometimes hot, smelly work or cold, smelly work as the case might be, but I appreciate it as well. Guys, check out what these guys are up to. Go to Colorado Parks and Wildlife website. See what the population is really doing. Don't always base your uh, judgment of a fishery on your angling, because trust me, it's not generally very accurate of what the fisheries really look like. If you guys want to join the conversation on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, we'd appreciate that. Otherwise, we hope you'll tune in, and we'll see you next week.